Torchlight Infinite is a brand new loot-based action RPG. And as you take your first steps into the world of Leptis, you're probably wondering, what's the best build to start with? So today, I'm going to be talking about three beginner-friendly builds, including a Rahan Whirlwind build that offers extremely smooth mapping and high mobility. After all, no ARPG would be complete without a Whirlwind or Cyclone build. A Flamejet build on Gemma, which allows you to drop your damage on the boss, then run around. You can focus on dodging abilities, which makes for a low-stress playstyle and a minion army build on Moto, because why should you have to kill things yourself? You have more important things to do, like picking up all that loot. All of these builds will provide an extremely smooth leveling experience and don't have any mandatory items. You'll easily be able to complete the axe and progress all the way through to farming Time Mark 7. Then you'll be able to farm the gear you need to do Time Mark 8, Path of a Brave, and Endgame bosses. Before I continue, a special thanks to XD for sponsoring this video. If you haven't already tried Torchlight Infinite, you can do so and support the channel by following my link in the description and the pinned comment. So far, I've spent over 100 hours playing Torchlight Infinite, mostly during the previous closed beta test 3. And one of my favorite aspects of a game is how many different builds you can make. The best build to play is the one you're going to have fun with, and there are a lot of options. So here are three builds that I enjoyed and found success with. But if you do want to play something else later, or you just change your mind and you're not enjoying the skill, Torchlight Infinite offers a lot of flexibility. You can respect your character completely for free until level 80. And even after level 80, it's not that expensive. Just by playing, you'll get all the currency you need to respec a character completely. I've made sure to include a lot of the mechanical interactions and items I've used in each build. So even if you don't actually play any of these three, you'll hopefully be able to learn something and incorporate those ideas into your own build. Feel free to always use the chapters to jump around and rewatch a section later. And so without further ado, the first build that I want to showcase is a fire conversion whirlwind build on Torchlight Infinite's Berserker archetype, Rahan. The reason that I chose Fire Conversion is it greatly simplifies the gearing process because you can simply ignore enemy resistances. This means that you don't have to worry about if a boss is resistant to your damage, and you also don't have to worry about how much penetration you have on gear. The reason I chose Whirlwind should be obvious from the gameplay footage right now. It's a spinning build. Therefore, when you're playing it, you're winning. The ability to deal damage while moving makes the entire thing feel super smooth and allows you to build in a manner that's extremely beginner friendly. You don't need the absolute highest min-maxed damage because your damage will be extremely consistent and you'll never really feel too bad about dodging something because you're going to continue doing damage when you're moving away from the boss. There is one small downside of Whirlwind, and that is that it's not unlocked until level 30. So at lower levels, if you want to deal fire damage, I suggest going with Flame Slash. And if you want to do that, just take the God of Might tree like I talk about later. Alternatively, you can use Berserking Blade like I did and build around physical damage with God of War until you're a higher level and then equip Whirlwind and switch over to Fire Conversion. If you need extra healing early on, I found Resurrecting Warcry to be very helpful. It doesn't require any kills to charge, unlike Source skills. And if you want a leveling skill that's about hitting hard but infrequently, I had quite a bit of fun with Ground Shaker, an Earthquake style skill that uses Demolisher charges. The main reason why this build feels absolutely amazing is because Whirlwind is a channeling skill, but it works a bit differently from most other channeled skills in Torchlight Infinite. Most channeled skills will require you to channel up to a maximum number of stacks with increasing effect per stack. Whirlwind channels up to a maximum number of stacks, then releases a large AoE pulse of damage and resets those stacks. So you're constantly going up to five, releasing your Wind Blade, resetting and continuing. The Wind Blades have a large AoE, so even if you're not really too invested into AoE, you won't have any trouble clearing. And being a channeled skill, it has that huge advantage of dealing damage while moving. With most other attacks, and even most other spells, you'll have to stop to attack an enemy, then if the enemy tries to attack you, you'll probably spend some time dodging. If you deal persistent damage, you may continue to deal damage as you dodge. But for anything hit-based, you're going to stop dealing damage and then start again once you're able to stand still. For Whirlwind, you can just do both at once. And as a result, I decided to build this character in a way that was a little bit more defensive, to make it beginner friendly and help you survive your mistakes on early bosses so you can learn from them and figure out how to master it if you want to play a higher DPS glass cannon version much later. The two supports that are important for this are Hardened and Guard. Hardened causes you to take 25% less damage if you've hit an enemy recently. Due to the wide range of a wind blade and the fact that you can deal damage while dodging, you should always have Hardened up. It's not the highest DPS multiplier, but it seems like a small sacrifice when the build already has plenty of damage even for time mark 8 once the gear's min maxed. Guard on the other hand has a much higher damage multiplier, 
and when your channeling skill reaches maximum stacks, you'll gain Barrier if you don't already have it. Barrier gives you a shield that absorbs up to 50% of the damage you take. Now, Guard's Barrier is a little bit weaker than other sources, but it should still be more than enough to soften some of those blows, especially if you happen to be at half health. In terms of the rest of the supports, I experimented quite a bit to try to find what the highest damage was. Physical to Fire is completely mandatory unless you have another source of fire conversion. The goal is to deal 100% of our damage as fire, and you only get 50% from your talents. So you'll have to make up the other 50% either with a support or on gloves. The other two, Elemental Fusion and Precision Strike, were just the two that ended up being the most damage for me. So if you're not too sold on either of them, feel free to change it up a bit. For my movement skill, I went with Leap Attack, because who doesn't want to roleplay as Mario and just Goomba some enemies? Technically, it doesn't really matter which one you choose, I just liked the way Leap Attack played with the high attack speed. Now there's two supporting skills that I suggest picking up fairly early on. Those are Bloodthirst and Scorch. Bloodthirst will give you a long duration buff that refreshes as you hit and kill enemies, which grants you attack speed in exchange for inflicting a light physical dot on your character. The degen is very easy to manage if you have any recovery at all, and it will be a significant DPS boost. On the other hand, Scorch is a curse, causing enemies to take additional fire damage. In some ways, Scorch is an additional multiplier on top of that, and I'm applying it via Terrain of Malice and Abysmal Hatred. This turns it into a pseudo aura around my character once I activate it, which makes it a lot easier to apply consistently. Now, the last supporting skill I'm using is Bull's Rage, but I wouldn't suggest doing this early on. Instead, go for something that gives you healing, like Resurrection Warcry. In the late game, your recovery gets so good that you don't need the additional healing. So I like Bull's Rage with Death Will. The reason for Death Will is instead of paying a large upfront cost, about half your life to activate Bull's Rage, you'll gain the large damage multiplier in exchange for inflicting yourself with a second dot. But because it's a damage over time effect, things like regain certainly help and make it a lot easier to heal through. Bull's Rage is a large DPS boost, but if you're ever uncomfortable and find yourself dying, it's not completely mandatory for the build until you really start getting geared and pushing T8 content. In terms of auras, there's quite a bit of flexibility here. Personally, I liked using Charged Flames and either Acuteness Imbue or Fearless, depending on how my gear was. At low gear, Acuteness or Flame Imbue are super, super helpful. Use Acuteness if you have fairly high base damage on your weapon, and use Flame if you have fairly low base damage on your weapon. Once you get to a higher level, Charged Flame, because it's a more multiplier, is again very good. You can combine this with either Fearless, this will help to fix your crit and therefore help you do more damage, or if your crit is already fine, you could go with something like Weapon Amplification. I'm also using a Defensive Aura in the form of Rejuvenation. I found this to be quite nice just to get a little bit of extra life recovery, and I'm running it on my life with seal conversion rather than running it on my mana, since I already reserved almost all of my mana. However, it should be noted this isn't mandatory to the build. This is only mandatory as you add more effects that cost you life without effects that restore your life. Definitely feel free to slap it on if you're ever feeling like your recovery is low, but don't feel obligated to use it if instead you feel like you're struggling for damage or you have too small of a life pool and it will reserve too much. One of my favorite things about this build is I'm able to use a really cool tech with Cast While Channeling. Cast While Channeling is a trigger support. This will trigger other skills at a fixed interval when a condition is met. In this case, the condition is while you're channeling. Since Whirlwind is a channeling skill, you'll almost always be channeling. And I'm using it to activate Fixate, which applies Mark to the enemy and gives you a large double damage buff, and Reform the defensive skill. The reason I like Cast While Channeling as opposed to Auto Defense, Death Will, or Cast When Damage Taken, is that those all have various penalties to the effects of the skills being triggered, whereas this only has a damage penalty. But neither Fixate nor Reform do damage, so it's totally fine. Reform is a guard skill that refreshes your barrier and increases barrier absorption. Personally, I found it to be the most consistent defensive skill, although if you wanted to use something like Aegis of Fire, Frost Shield, Stone Skin, or Delayed Pain, they would all work instead. Defensive skills in Torchlight Infinite are just something you have to feel out for yourself and go with whatever feels best. But of course, skills alone do not a build make. There's also hero traits and talents. In terms of hero traits, Rahans is quite interesting. I'm not going to talk about the 15 or 50 talents. Those aren't really choices. What you need to know is they allow your burst to have supports, and you should again put the Fizz to Fire conversion if you're not converting 100% elsewhere, plus something else for damage. I went with Steamroll because it has a very large damage multiplier, and Burst being a triggered skill doesn't have to deal with the attack speed penalty. At tier 32, I went with Frenzy Furious. This allows my Rage to help to fix my crit strike rating and crit strike damage. The build will have Rage most, if not all, of the time, so this is quite a significant permanent buff. 
At level 62, I went with Boiling Anger to gain 15 rage on crit strike. In combination with a build's high crit strike chance, this means you'll almost always be capped, even during your berserk, at 100 rage. And then I combined this with Reverberation. Remember, you're basically going to be capped at 100 rage, and with Fervor you should be pretty close to if not capped at 100% crit strike chance. So you'll be triggering burst every 0.4 seconds. Burst is a skill tied to Rahan's hero trait that does a significant amount of physical damage based on your weapon. If you want to go into a Blood Striker tree, something that I would only advise if you have quite good gear, you can instead take Uncontrolled Anger. This will turn you from less of a consistent damage build into more of a burst damage build. You'll still have quite good Berserk uptime, and you'll have 50% additional damage, a 1.5 times multiplier, during your Berserk. But it causes you to lose 15% of maximum life per second while Berserk is active, so you're going to struggle with recovery, especially if you're undergeared. And for me personally, I ended up feeling a little too squishy and didn't find this worth it. Now early on, as I mentioned, you should probably start with God of War if you're going to go full physical. That's to grab Brutality for 35% extra physical damage and cannot deal elemental damage. You'll combine that with Endless Fervor where you have Fervor with 45% Fervor effect, so you can go crit from a very low level. But once you have 38 talent points, I suggest switching over to God of Might, and Warlord. This should happen right around the level 30 range once you have Whirlwind, so it's a perfect time to swap the build over. In that case, you'll start with God of Might. Now God of Might's tier 10 kind of has three good options. Tenacity is the best defensive option, Burnout is the most damage as long as you have at least 20 points in the tree, and Elimination is your best choice if you don't. If you're just starting out but using a fire skill, then I'd start with Elimination. With 20 points in the tree, you can grab Fueling, this causes damage to ignore enemy fire resistance. Ignore is not the same as lowering or penetrating. Ignore treats the number as zero regardless of what it is. So if a boss is extremely resistant to fire damage and has 100% fire resistance, with fueling, you would treat that as zero and deal your full damage. However, if you also stack a lot of penetration and end up reducing an enemy's fire resistance to negative 30%, fueling would ignore that and still treat it as zero, causing you to do less damage. As a result, what this means is once you've taken fueling, you don't want to have any penetration on your gear, and you don't want to go out of your way to lower enemy resistances, as that won't scale your damage. One very important thing to grab early on is the God of Might medium talent that gives 8% attack speed and minus 10 attack skill cost. This will basically make your Whirlwind free for the rest of your play experience. From there, we want to move on to Warlord. Now, personally, I like Wildfire. 100% additional damage against enemies on low life, we always deal fire, so it's 100% additional damage. Means when bosses are most dangerous, you kill them the fastest. If you just wanted to clear maps quickly, sweep is your best option. And if you want the most defenses, then rock is also pretty good. But personally, I'm going to stick with wildfire for the execute effect. Then at level 36, there's two talents that you should probably swap between fairly often. Those are true flame, enemies that die of fire damage, you only deal fire damage, will explode dealing a dot equal to 15% of the overkill for 4 seconds on nearby enemies. This makes your clear much faster, you can hit a couple enemies in a pack and the entire thing just explodes. It looks absolutely great and feels awesome to play. It doesn't really do anything for large single target bosses like Keegan. This is where Focus Blow comes in. Area skills deal up to 40% extra AoE damage to enemies of a center. Now once you get really min-maxed, your choice actually depends on your gearing, because you can get enemies explode as a weapon implicit via corrosion. You can get enemies explode as a modifier on your weapon or a modifier on your chest piece. Or you could get focus blow as a modifier on your weapon. And the focus blow will not stack with a talent version. So if you have that, pick up true flame and watch the world burn. One of her talent that's extremely important in the Whirler tree is the medium talent at tier 18 that causes 50% of physical damage to be converted to fire damage. This is how we get 100% of physical damage converted to fire, which is extremely important for the build to function. Now, initially when I played this build, my third talent choice was actually Blood Striker, since I found I could spend my life and turn that into damage. However, it also led to some frustrating deaths, where I spent too much life right before I made a mistake and got hit by something. So, especially if you're a new player, or you don't have great gear, I strongly advise the Ranger Tree instead. Ranger gives us access to Lucky via Fluke. Crit Strikes have the Lucky effect while you have at least 50 Fervor rating. Lucky causes damage to be rolled twice and you take the higher result. Now at first glance, this might not sound very effective, but it can often be as high as a 20 or 30% DPS boost. I combined it with Impending, which is enemies within 10 meters take 6% more damage every 0.25 seconds, stacking up to 5 times. You should be within 10 meters most of the time, so this means enemies take 30% more damage. Think of it as an additional support link on your Whirlwind. If you're struggling to get your crit cap, 
then go with Keep It Up instead, as this greatly enhances the Fervor effect. Something else very nice about the Ranger Tree is it gives you access to Fervor. This is done by the Tier 18 Micro Talent for 12% melee damage. You'll want three ranks in that. Then you move on to the Medium Talent for 10% crit strike rating per nearby enemy. And finally, the Tier 24 gain Fervor when there are enemies nearby. There should always be enemies nearby since you're a melee build and can sit fairly close on top of things, especially to maximize focus blow. And Fervor itself gives you 2% attack and spell crit strike rating per point up to 100 points. You can get Fervor on gloves, which is actually what I have in the min-maxed version of this setup. However, Fervor is one of the rarest and most difficult mods to roll. So those gloves will be very expensive and likely out of your price range as you're just starting out and progressing your character. Luckily, Ranger gives you the option to skip that entirely and put most of your investments somewhere else, such as into a weapon. Now, as you progress your character, you're going to be making a lot of your gear via crafting. If you want to know more about crafting in Torchlight Infinite, I'm going to have a comprehensive crafting guide that covers everything from the basics all the way to advanced crafting tips and tricks. So get subscribed and watch for that within the next few days. This build has zero mandatory legendary items. Legendary items certainly make what it does better, but you can easily clear Time Mark 7 without any legendaries at all. If you're looking for a legendary item early on, personally, I like either the Cursed Flame or Breaking Shadow. Either of these with an enemy explodes corrosion, gives you access to a pretty good amount of early damage, and super smooth clear. Again, it's not mandatory, but it certainly makes things feel quite a bit better. Gearing in Torchlight Infinite is overall very flexible. In many cases, you don't need specific affixes on specific items, but there are a few things that you'll want to prioritize before focusing on damage, mainly capping all four of your resistances at 75% and getting to around 5,000 life. Life can be added to your gear via the Vigor Ember, which is a prefix for 21 to 100 maximum life, and resistances can be added as a suffix via the Tenacity Ember. And these embers can add both life and resistances to pretty much everything. Most of the basic embers, the Vigor, Rivalry, Essence, Tenacity, Cultivation, and Soul Burst, tend to roll similar things on all items. However, the Ruling, Technique, Ominous, and Restless embers tend to roll specific, much more powerful items depending on the slot the item goes in. For example, on Gloves, the Technique Ember can roll Fervor. Technique and Ruling Embers require four modifiers on the gear, which is why crafting anything with a rare affix such as Fervor is quite expensive. Ominous and Restless require six, so anything you do with them is expensive. While this isn't a comprehensive list of everything that can be done with these Embers, I have highlighted a few modifiers in the chart you'll see on screen right now for things to look out for and try to aim for, but it can get very expensive, especially if you're re-rolling multiple Ruling, Technique, Ominous, or Restless crafts. So early on, don't really worry about any of these. Treat them as icing on the cake. Later on, when you're looking to perfect your items, look to my crafting guide for some tips on how to do that. While you don't need any specific legendary items for this build to function, here are a few that I found to be helpful. First off, Rock Lizard Skull is a great leveling item. It gives you a decent amount of life, a decent amount of life regeneration per tenacity stack, and a chance to gain tenacity when damaged. In terms of endgame legendaries, None even come close to the Tide of Sticks. You get a massive boon to life, some attack and crit strike rating, and a huge amount of damage per 800 life recently lost. You're constantly degenerating yourself with some of your combat buffs, so you'll always be losing life, thus always gaining damage. It also restores up to 50% of life every 4 seconds when life is not full, and non-full life will be considered low life. This is the sort of helmet that you'd need if you wanted to leverage the Blood Striker tree. And additionally, if you use an aura with seal conversion to reserve a bit of your life, you'll always be procking a healing effect, and it feels absolutely great. For chess pieces, while you're leveling, try to look out for a Sky Devourer armor. It gives a decent amount of life and resistance, along with AoE damage and skill area. Much like with a Rock Lizard helmet, this is definitely something you'll want to replace eventually. However, it's a great stopgap, and it has pretty solid all-around stats. During the closed beta test 3, I found it to be quite common, so I didn't have any trouble obtaining it. Another good option is Heavy Wear. This offers erosion resistance, something that's a little bit harder to get, along with a beefy amount of life, and enemies both take additional damage and deal less additional damage. So you'll be a lot tankier, you'll do more damage, and you want to stand next to enemies anyway, so this is kind of a win-win-win all around. Now, if we're talking endgame forever items, you're probably going to be using a rare, but if you really want to use a legendary, there are two that come to mind. The first is Dragon Breath Armor. This gives you a beefy 30% increased maximum life at the top end, a whopping up to 220% fire damage, and 30% of physical damage taken converted to fire, 
This will apply your fire resistance to physical damage taken, which is honestly an absurd level of defense. Unfortunately, it comes with a downside that you can only deal fire damage and that you'll always ignite yourself for up to 500 ignite damage a second when there are enemies nearby. So you will need a decent amount of recovery if you want to leverage this chest. Alternatively, if you wanted to do the Blood Striker archetype, you'll definitely want a Crimson King. It has 30 to 35% increased maximum life, and you will not want any energy shield, as if you have energy shield, you'll take additional damage, which isn't good. However, it converts 100% of mana cost to life cost, allowing you to completely ignore mana costs on your build, and it adds up to 7 to 9 physical damage per 800 life lost recently. This does synergize with this Tide of Sticks, as both will stack. Additionally, it gives life restoration per second for every 6% of life missing, less damage taken for every 5% of life missing, and 6% crit strike rating for every 7% of life missing. So the more life you're missing, the more damage you'll do with the Crimson King. But I only advise looking into this if you're okay with a high risk, high reward playstyle where you'll do a ton of damage, but probably die a ton as well, at least if you make mistakes. In terms of the other slots, I don't have too many legendary recommendations. If you happen to find a pair of Boots of Sinned Fire while leveling, they're great early on, but they just don't have the defensive stats that you need for late game. Similarly, Mark of Thrill or Ice and Fire, especially with Conversion, could be good early, but Rare Gloves with defensive stats, Crit, Fervor, and Conversion are just way too good in the late game. For your belt, the only thing that comes to mind is the Eternal Sun. This will make your recovery feel a lot better, especially if your life tends to hover around half or less. And it also synergizes very well with something like Tide of Sticks. For amulets, I don't really recommend any legendary amulets, because I found the injury buffer to be invaluable. Injury buffer prevents you from getting one shot. Instead, you'll take the same damage, but it will be delayed over a period of several seconds. While it's not necessarily mandatory to have a tier 1 roll, having a little bit makes the build feel much, much tankier, and I do think that's a worthwhile trait. For rings, one item that comes to mind as a great leveling item is Elemental Envoy. It's an extremely common drop, it's fairly well-rounded, but unfortunately it doesn't have life, so long-term you'll definitely want to replace it. Endgame item-wise, the only two I can think of are Wind Breath Dispersion and Elemental Rain. Elemental Rain would only be if you're heavily invested into Tenacity Blessing, and Wind Breath Dispersion gives a little bit of damage if you have it in the right ring slot, but it's definitely not something unreplaceable. If it's cheap, go ahead and pick one up and use it for a while. If it's expensive, definitely give it a pass. Again, I think ultimately here, you're going to want two rare rings that you craft yourself, rather than legendaries. I started playing this build in the closed beta test 3, because I wanted to see how Torchlight Infinite handled melee. I enjoyed the ease of scaling defenses, and the fact that Whirlwind is super fluid as a skill for damage delivery. There's something about just spinning through enemies which feels awesome. Out of all the builds, this was the one with the most trial and error through the character creation process. Initially, I'd been trying to do pure physical damage, which stalled out fairly early. I'm sure if I go back now, I could have done a much better job, but at the time I was unsure of how to proceed, so I went with Fire Conversion to better ignore enemy defenses and scale my damage. Fire Conversion had been something I dropped early on, because I couldn't get 100% conversion on my Berserking Blade at low levels. But once I figured it out through Warlord, it worked flawlessly and pushed me all the way up through Time Mark 7. From there, I refined the build, tweaking auras, skills, supports, and gear. At the time, I'd been using about a 300 DPS weapon, one of the legendaries I bought off a trade market with enemies explode. The single target was definitely slower than I would have liked, as I only had about 4 mil DPS, but the clear was incredible. In fact, out of all the builds I've played, nothing even comes close still. I fixed this by crafting a weapon with much better single target. You don't need any ominous or sleepless for this process, but they will add a ton of damage later when you can afford to make them. So the build feels great when clearing, whether using True Flame or Enemies Explode, and you can use Dark Surge to summon enemies around a boss to add splash damage and DPS it down even faster. It's awesome to watch the build, especially with the large wind slashes from your whirlwind constantly triggering due to the high attack rate. Being able to move while deal damage feels incredible. You can move out of boss mechanics and laugh at them because they're still losing health, but you aren't. Not that you'll need it most of the time. Between barrier and harden, you can tank a hit or two or quite a lot, especially once you put on Tide of a Sticks, which while it is a late game boss drop, I do think is worth it if you're going to play this build for a while. This is the build that I learned Keegan on and this is the build where I first killed the Time Mark 8 Traveler. It feels more than capable of doing all the content that Torchlight Infinite has to offer. The gameplay is pretty simple. Spin directly on top of enemies for maximum effect. Spin away if you need to dodge something. Hit your curse and your other cooldowns when they come up without having to worry too much about special timing. Once you get a bit of gear, you won't really need them except for bosses anyway. All RPGs need to have a great spin to win build, and this is Torchlight Infinite. But maybe melee isn't really your cup of tea, or this particular build just doesn't appeal to you. 
in which case you might like one of the other two builds I'm going to be showcasing next. They both offer a good mix of damage and defenses, and feature skills you can use from a low level all the way through endgame, along with again focusing on a relatively straightforward playstyle and gearing. Before I get to that though, another special thanks to XD for sponsoring this video. It's quite common for companies to sponsor advertisements for their game, but I was both surprised and impressed that XD was excited to sponsor a build showcase, to help ensure that players new to Torchlight Infinite will have something solid to play for their first experiences with the world of Leptis. So if you're just finding the game for the first time, and either this build or any of the following builds appeal to you, be sure to support the channel by checking out Torchlight Infinite through the link in the description or the pinned comment. But now let's get back to the video. Sticking with a fire theme, the next build I want to talk about is a Flame Jet Gemma. This is actually the first build I played when I picked Torchlight Infinite up. What attracted me to Flame Jet is it has a very set and forget playstyle. You can throw one down under the boss, then run around while you focus on dodging mechanics. As you continue to scale up the gear, you'll be able to place multiple flame jets, which means more damage, but also a little bit less time to run around. Out of all the builds I've played so far, this was by far the easiest leveling experience, though it is a little bit more difficult to scale for Time Mark 8 content as a result. This build is also a little different in that it's not life-based. It's low life, and therefore focuses on scaling energy shield to fit in additional auras. I was surprised at just how easy this was in Torchlight Infinite. The leveling experience was buttery smooth even as a life-based build, and once I got to the endgame, I had a few decent shield items and I decided, well, why not throw them on, reserve my life, and see what happens. One of my favorite things about Gemma's Frostfire aspect is you can scale both cold and fire damage, meaning you have a lot of additional options once you do reach endgame. The reason I went for a shield-based defense for Flamejet is, with all the tags, it's very easy to fit in more and more damage auras, but there's no way I could fit that many in on mana alone. This build isn't quite as tanky as the Rahan build, but it is by no means squishy either, sitting at that comfortable medium. The clear speed similarly will be a bit slower, though there are some options to improve that, and the bossing is excellent, especially on little to no gear. While I was leveling, I got a scorching words to drop. And this low level legendary mace gives plus one to fire skills, in addition to a lot of flat damage to spells. One or two of these while leveling will absolutely carry you to the end game. And honestly, you can use dual scorching words all the way to time mark seven. Now for a little explanation on how flame jet itself works. To start with, when you use the skill, it will create a lava puddle under the enemy. This deals persistent fire damage. Then at regular intervals based on your cast speed, the lava pool will eject molten rock, which targets nearby enemies and explodes. Depending on how many terra charges you have, more enemies will be targeted. In general, the lava pool will eject three volleys over its duration, but increased duration can definitely get it to eject four or even maybe five. It's also important to note that these are parabolic projectiles which cannot split. Projectile skills in Torchlight Infinite are broadly split into two categories, horizontal projectiles, which tend to scale off of additional projectiles, and parabolic projectile skills, which tend to scale off of split quality. Because Flamejet cannot split, there's no mechanics I know of which will add additional projectiles to the skill. Instead, you'll have to scale it via other means. From my experience so far, cast speed didn't seem all that helpful. All I tended to do was actually lower my damage because I ran out of mana faster, and mana sustain can be a bit tricky, so do pay attention to that part later in the showcase. For utility skills, the most important one to talk about is Mana Boil. Mana Boil gives you 15% extra spell damage when active in exchange for consuming 5% of your maximum mana per second. Early on while you're leveling, I don't suggest using Mana Boil, but in the late game, it is a massive damage boost that is absolutely important. The other utility skills that I went with are Soul Eating Circle and Scorch. Scorch works exactly the same as it did in the previous build. Soul Eating Circle, on the other hand, gives a buff on you that gains bonus stacks whenever an enemy enters the circle. This buff will give you 2% spell damage stacking up to 15 times, therefore capping out at 30, and 0.5% elemental and erosion resistance penetration for spells per stack, up to 10. So you can get quite a bit of damage and penetration. The area lasts 6 seconds, so it tends to build up quite a few stacks, and it will gain more initial stacks from strong monsters such as bosses. And in addition, I'm using Frigid Transmission as my movement skill. This is because, as a cold skill, it actually scales off of almost everything the build stacks due to Gemma's Frostfire aspect, which means you can actually kind of blink onto packs and watch them pop. Another nice feature of Frigid Transmission doing this much damage is when it freezes a target, it will refresh its cooldown, so you can often blink consecutively from pack to pack to pack without any delay. For my auras, I'm running both Charged Flames and Precise Projectiles on my mana. Remember, 
Flame Jet is a fire projectile skill, so it will scale off of both of these. Early on, feel free to use something like Flame Imbue instead if the mana feels too constricted. But where most of my auras sit is reserved on my life. That's where my Flame Imbue is, along with a cast on severe injury for the defensive skill forced start. This means when I take a large amount of damage, my energy shield charge will automatically start and be enhanced for a short duration. This should be enough time to get me back to full and not worry about death. Additionally, I'm also using Seal Conversion with Death Pact to apply Fixate. Fixate is a very nice damage boost and also scales with the number and strength of enemies that it's cast on. So if you're looking for another way to get damage early without having to rely on Mana Boil, I suggest manually casting Fixate, then moving it to the Death Pact early on as you're able to scale more shield. Now, for the Frostfire aspect, there's a lot of synergy with both Cold and Fire damage. So, at level 32, I took Abnormal Energy. This means that I will get 50% additional damage against ignited enemies. Your Flame Jet hits quite often, so it has a very good chance to ignite with a fairly low ignite chance. I then took Spread, so I no longer have to cast Frostfire Rampage. Though, if you don't mind casting it for yourself, Fusion Body is a decent choice and will actually be a much more defensive option as opposed to what I've gone with. And then I took Seeping In. This way, I don't have to worry about casting a bunch of fire skills as soon as my Frostfire Rampage ends. And while at maximum fusion energy, I also get 18% fire and cold piercing. This is part of why this build isn't so reliant on stacking fire or elemental piercing. For my traits, I started with Goddess of Knowledge. This is because the Goddess of Knowledge path allows you a lot of options when it comes to scaling spells and especially when scaling Focus Blessing. For the large talents, I chose Beacon and Preparation. Now Beacon does make the mana costs a little more problematic, However, you're not really spamming your main skill, so it didn't seem to be too much of an issue. And in fact, preparation helps to correct this. Since you'll gain stacks of Focus Blessing automatically as Mana Boil consumes your mana. Additionally, you'll get Mana Regeneration per stack of Focus Blessing. So the more Focus Blessing that you get, the less mana is a concern. From there, I progressed through the tree with a focus on spell damage, a little bit of mana, as much shield as I could get, and of course the Focus Blessing buffs. Now, next up you have two options that each do slightly different things, but I'd say are fairly equally weighted. You can either go with Magister, which will give you a lot more upfront damage, which will give you a lot more defensive flexibility. Personally, I went with Magister next. I grabbed Bunch, which gives plus one to maximum focus blessing, and 3% additional, think of that as a multiplier, spell damage per stack of focus blessing owned. If you really wanted to go all in on the defenses, you probably could try out Inner Slide instead, but I didn't find it to be too necessary. And then I went with Play Safe, because 40% main skill spell damage is absolutely massive. With the right weapon, you could consider Mind Blade as well, but I struggled to find a weapon with Mind Blade that was actually better than just using Play Safe. I'm sure it exists at the high end, but on the other hand, this is a beginner-friendly showcase, so I'm going to go with the option that works right out of the box. And again, when it comes to my Magister passives, I really wanted to focus in on spell damage and shield. Spell damage is the best way to scale damage for something like Flame Jet, and shield is the best way to scale your defenses if you're actually using a shield build. But early on, don't feel too bad if you end up just taking some pure life nodes, since you probably won't have enough shield for it to be super relevant until you get to around level 70 or so. Again, that was just the case for me. With trade, you might be able to buy some nice shield gear and go low life from very early on. Finally, for my last talent tree, I chose Spirit Caller. This is what I mentioned by defensive flexibility. For the first large talent, you can take either Adaptation, 25% of physical damage taken converted to a random element, or Translucent for 20% additional Fire, Cold, and Lightning. Don't worry, the tree gives you an option to deal each of those later. The reason Adaptation is so good is it means your elemental resistances apply to one quarter of your physical damage taken, effectively mitigating about four fifths of it. For the second large talent, I went with Peculiar Vibe. If you need the penetration, then penetrating is very good, but I found that I had enough penetration from other sources that enemy resistances were really a non-issue, and instead I wanted 25% additional damage to enemies with an ailment. Remember, for our hero trait, we already want to be inflicting Ignite on stuff, and as a result, you won't need any ailment chance elsewhere in your build. Now, going through the Spirit Caller tree, there are a couple of medium talents I want to highlight. First, this one. 20% chance to gain a Tenacity and Agility Blessing when receiving Focus Blessing. Remember, if you have Mana Burn active, you're always going to be obtaining Focus Blessings. This means there's a very high likelihood that you'll have permanent Tenacity and Agility Blessings as well, which is why this build could probably be played on Thea given her massive Blessing synergy. And though I didn't give that a shot in the beta, I might do so in the future. Another important talent is the Micro Talent at Tier 21. This adds Fire, Cold, and Lightning damage to both spells and attacks. 
In this case, adding damage to attacks doesn't really help us, but adding the damage to spells means you'll be able to proc Translucent for all three elements 100% of the time. Next up, I am going to cover the gearing in a bit more detail. Before I do though, I wanted to highlight one really important thing. By default, and as you'll see in most of my footage, you can only place one flame jet. Recasting the skill will move it to a new location rather than create a new effect that deals damage independently. However, there is a stat on certain items that says you can have an additional ground skill placed. This will be very important to your late game damage scaling as you can kind of think of it as doubling base damage. So if you're ever struggling for DPS, try to focus in on this more. Of course, the other thing to keep in mind with this is if you're placing twice as many, you'll be spending twice as much mana. So on both of your rings, you're probably going to at least want the enchantment for minus skill cost. This will make it easier and easier to spam your abilities to the point where the mana costs are honestly completely trivial. I did all of the testing and gameplay in fairly basic gear, so I did still have to watch my mana, but at the same time, it wasn't too bad. I just couldn't blindly right click continually. This is also why I'd suggest the legendary chest piece Kingly Armor as your ultimate endgame best in slot. It means you'll go from being able to drop two flame jets up to being able to drop three. But do keep in mind, this is a fairly rare item, so it may be expensive or hard to get early on, and you can always wait till later when you're really min-maxing. Instead, aim for plus one on your amulet as soon as possible, even if it means the rest of the stats on the item aren't very good. For the rest of your gear, be sure to cap your resistances. This will be 75, or higher if you're taking some defensive stats for maximum resistances. I found that there aren't any special demands for belt or rings on this build, so those are good places to get a lot of your early resists. Beyond that, I found that 4,000 shield was the minimum to be comfortable in endgame, but it felt a lot better once I got 5 or 6,000. Something else important to note before I get more into the gearing, all of the gameplay that you've seen for this build so far was done with only the lowest rarity packed spirits. So it's not like you need any special legendary pack spirits to play this build. Instead, you should think of it as icing on the cake. It's something you may eventually have if this is your forever build, but if you're only going to play it for a couple of weeks or maybe just the season, it really won't matter. You'll be able to do all the content regardless. And again, if you ultimately don't like how this skill plays once you get to tier eight, there's plenty of other options you can swap to that will work with the same setup. Now, I already mentioned the most important legendaries for this build, the Scorching Words as an early game item, and the kingly armor as an endgame best in slot. However, I also wanted to highlight a few other options that you might find helpful either as a temporary item or something for the late game. The first of which is the insight version of the sky devourer armor. This provides area of effect, so your clear will feel a bit better, area damage, and a decent amount of shield. Undying faith, which is a great armor if you're any sort of low life build. Grace boots, which will help you sustain focus. Elemental envoy, it's a solid damage ring for any elemental build. Mark of Thrill, kind of a bad item overall, but it'll be a cheap fervor generator if you need it. Ice and Fire, remember we scale off of both cold damage and fire damage, so this offers a lot of scaling. Pentagram Astrolabe, great leveling item. Until you can get a plus one ground scale amulet, if you can get spell rolls on your Pentagram Astrolabe, this will offer you massive damage. Unbreakable Shield, another fairly cheap option that's good while leveling. Sage's Insight, which I'd consider more of an endgame option to scale your damage. Jumbleize, which works kind of like a Void Battery in Path of Exile, allowing you to really focus in on your blessings. And Light Hunter Belt, which is additional damage along with a large shield bonus. Now, most of these items I mentioned towards the start are relatively common or low-level legendaries. They don't have the best stats, but are good filler pieces. And you should consider using them once you have enough life or shield along with resistances on the rest of your gear. However, the last three in particular are much rarer and more expensive. They come from bosses found late in the endgame but don't expect it to be cheap and don't expect it to be an item that you'll get early on. This Flamejet build was my first build in Torchlight Infinite, and I'm very happy with the result. I took a skill that I liked while leveling, and before I knew it, I was in Time Mark 7. Early on, I was playing a life-based build and trying to scale armor, but I kept ending up with gear and passives that had both life and shield. This was probably because I was so heavily invested into Goddess of Knowledge, so I decided to give low life a shot, and a bit later, I was farming Time Mark 7 with no problem. I got to around 4k shield, which was playable, but a bit rough. As I approached 6k total unreserved life and shield, it smoothed out immensely. You can either dual wield or use a shield with this build. Early on, I swapped between both, but ultimately I ended up settling on a shield because it was just better than the second weapon option that I had at the time. Though, if you're ever lacking on damage, I do suggest two weapons. I also experimented for a while with adding in some armor or evasion, but ultimately settled again on injury buffer on my amulet to prevent one-shots. This seemed like the most cost-effective way to add defenses. 
From there, I found it very helpful to add a little bit of ES and life regain so that I can recover in between hits and in between my recharge. And as I continue to invest in a build, I definitely have a damage focus. I feel plenty tanky for Time Mark 8, even in very basic gear, but the damage definitely feels low in Time Mark 8 content right now. Time Mark 7 bosses and even the Traveler are totally fine. Gemma's Frostfire aspect definitely made the gearing a lot easier because I didn't just have to look for things with fire, spell, or elemental damage. I could also look for things with cold damage, which might not be as much in demand. So that gave me more flexibility to use items with the resistances or shield that I wanted. Feel free to experiment a bit with your third talent selection. I went full Goddess of Knowledge, but instead of running Spirit Caller, you could easily run Warlord or even Ranger. Ranger will definitely fix your crit and make it so that you don't need to use Mark of Thrill to get your fervor rating. If you want to sit back and watch the world burn, then I suggest Frostfire Gemma with Flame Jet. But watching the world burn can get a little bit lonely, especially if you don't have friends. However, you'll never be alone with this last build, Moto's Army. That's right, minion players. I didn't forget about you. This is a synthetic army build, the best way that I've found so far to level minions in Torchlight Infinite. While leveling, I had a lot of success by combining both Summon Spider Tank with Machine Guards. This allowed me to swarm enemies and keep them from ever attacking me directly. In fact, it was so successful that I made it through the story with far too few defenses. One thing that I want to call out right from the beginning is Dark Gate allows you to pull your minions towards you, which really speeds up the leveling process and makes them feel super smooth while completing time marks. Most of the time, I'm not the biggest fan of minion builds in games. I find the playstyle to be a little bit too passive. Luckily, Moto's overload management, in addition to the minion support skills, mean this is going to be a fairly active minion playstyle. It's less about fighting enemies and more about playing Raid Lead Simulator. And trust me, back in my Raid Leading days, I would have happily killed and resurrected my Raiders without any regrets at all if they were this good at following orders. Okay, maybe necromancy is a bad plan, but luckily, Commander Moto is a clean, ethical, necromancy-free minion build. What this build excels at is being followed by an army of minions. It has a very similar hands-off feel to the Flame Jet build, and I found I needed far fewer defenses on this build than I used for my other characters. I scaled it all the way into Time Mark 7 without any legendaries or any pack spirits beyond again the lowest rarity ones. On this build, you'll want to use higher item level bases as soon as possible because it can be quite energy hungry, but I was able to push it up to around 500 energy, which let me use two 6 support skills in combination with one 5 support skills. This allows me to hit the 8 minion threshold that I was aiming for while also rounding out my defenses. To explain why I'm building this way, I first need to explain how Machine Army works. It gives your minions a significant buff for each stack, capping at 8, but you gain one stack per minion. This means ideally you want 8 minions. The way this build can accomplish that is via 3 spider tanks, 3 machine guards, and 2 lightning spirit magis. Or, if you want to get fancier, maybe 3 spider tanks, a second spider tank for 3 more, and 2 lightning spirit magis. In better gear, particularly with legendaries like Warhorn, I do think it's correct to drop the machine guards entirely. Three spider tanks on their own didn't quite provide the coverage I wanted, but mechanical modification seems great. This halves the number of synthetic troops you can have rounding down while transforming them into super minions. So while I did originally level with spider tank plus machine guard, it's honestly quite hard to scale both at once. So for the endgame, I think you should focus purely on spider tank plus lightning spirit. They're both projectile attack users, so it makes things a lot easier. Normally, you'll have a hard limit of six total synthetic minions, though it seems like Warhorn does allow you to bypass this, raising the total to eight. Out of all the legendary items available, Warhorn's definitely the one I suggest targeting and trying to obtain as early as possible. It's what's going to give you the power to scale from Time Mark 7 to Time Mark 8 and complete later floors in Path of a Brave. So here's a quick look at some of the skills and supports that I'm currently using. Right now, I have Summon Spider Tank. By that, I mean prepare for trouble and make it double, since I'm actually using two Summon Spider Tanks. The main one, which you'd want to have a majority of your minions in, and the secondary one, so that all of my minions are scaling off of my auras. For my mobility skill, I'm using Blink. This is just because I like it, you can use whatever skill you find to be the best. Then, as my supporting skills, I'm using both Dark Gate and Machine Army. Machine Army is where a bulk of my damage comes from, and Dark Gate is to make sure my minions follow me. Then I'm also using the Summon Thunder Spirit Magis, which in combination with Elemental Duo gives me two more minions. You'll notice all of my minions have Assault Command, 
since this makes minions much more aggressive and therefore much more responsive to attacking enemies. For my auras, precise projectiles is going to be the most damage you can get, and weapon amplification is quite good as a generic boost for all attack builds. Then finally, I'm using auto defense with reform and cooldown reduction. I went with a nice defensive skill so that I could get barrier back more consistently, since there's a lot of passives in my talents which give barrier. Modus hero trait offerings are very interesting. For level 32, I struggled a lot. I couldn't decide between all in, which makes your overload far more potent for a short duration and the effect declines, or charge forwards, where your overload duration is greatly increased. Ultimately, I did settle on charge forward as that felt a lot better when I was fighting bosses, though I don't think all in is incorrect either. For a while, I was also using brothers in arms. This completely automates your overload when you're clearing, at the cost of overload not being as effective on single target. But again, I didn't really struggle with clear on the build, instead I found single target to be what was potentially lacking, so I went with last stand. This makes your minions immune to death during overload, so you'll rarely have to resummon them. And when having overload, they gain a damage bonus based on missing life, so they'll take a lot of damage and just become stronger. If you want to really lean into that, you can go for broke. Minions will lose 60% of current life when gaining overload, and they gain a large crit bonus. But I found that rest and ready was a lot more reliable. With 40% overload duration, along with a significant damage boost while they have overload, I have nearly 100% uptime. The cooldown reduction from Warhorn would make this 100% overload uptime, which is when the build really starts to shine. Now in terms of my talents, I started off with God of Machines. It seemed like the obvious choice for a synthetic army build. I grabbed orders, since I wanted early damage, though shrink back wouldn't be wrong either. Gaining Barrier is a powerful defensive mechanic that will definitely help to smooth things on later bosses. Then in addition, I grabbed Mighty Guard. This way the minions scale up to a much higher level, and the aggressiveness loss is easily made up for by early supports. For the rest of the passives, I mostly just clicked damage early on. Again, I wasn't really getting attacked, so I didn't really feel the need to build defenses until much later. Like I mentioned before, aggressiveness isn't really a problem because right at tier 18, you have a medium talent for 25% minion aggressiveness. And right above it, you have one for plus one minion skill level, so your minions will be even higher level early on. For the late game, you'll absolutely want Alchemist, but for the early game, I found Machinist to be a lot smoother. Machinist gives you access to boss, plus one maximum synthetic troop quantity, and 50% synthetic troop duration. This essentially means your synthetic troops are permanent. It should be noted that the plus one maximum troop quantity does not increase the maximum total you can have. You can have six synthetic troops between all synthetic troop skills. This would increase the limit on an individual skill. So if a skill says a limit of five, it would go up to six. The second large talent that I chose was Burning Aggression. This increases minion aggressiveness and applies movement speed to your minions. This will mean that they run around a lot faster, which is of course great. I again chose a damage first approach because I still wasn't being attacked. Though, if at any point you feel like you are taking a lot of damage or dying, don't copy my bad decisions and instead go with something a little bit more defensive by picking up some of the life nodes early. And finally, the last tree I chose was Alchemist. This was for Source, minus 100% sealed mana for Spirit Magus skills. This is why you're able to use a 5 support Lightning Spirit Magus. It doesn't actually seal any mana, so it's completely free. Then I combined that with Warhorn to get a lot of damage for fairly minimal investment. Alchemist is one of the best generic trees for minion damage, even if all you're using is synthetic troops. Because I don't have any barrier talents, I wanted to get the talent at tier 21 to gain a barrier when I'm about to suffer a severe injury. This way, my barrier will activate whenever I need it most. It does leave me a little bit vulnerable to a bunch of small hits. Personally, I found I was able to dodge the small hits without too much issue, and I only had to really worry about big one-shots that I wasn't paying close enough attention to. I've also heard very good things about an ailment minion build using the Warlock tree. I didn't ultimately experiment with this for myself, but Chaco's going to have an in-depth and highly detailed guide on the official Torchlight Infinite Discord that can give you more information on how to play and scale that. If you want a link, it'll be down in the description below. And a special thanks to Chaco for answering all of my minion-related questions. I had quite a few of them and he was very patient. Now when it comes to gearing, minion builds are a little bit different. Which is to say, they don't have nearly as many avenues to scale their damage. There's of course plus skill levels, minion damage, and in a very few cases, added damage to minions. However, most of the stats that apply to you will not automatically apply to your minions. So here's a short list of some modifiers which will apply to your minions that you may want to look into. With that in mind, it also means the gearing can be relatively easy. 
instead of needing gear that's specific to your build, in a lot of cases you only need generic gear. Plus, if a fairly good item drops with minion stats, a non-minion player probably isn't going to be using it, which means they're going to put it up on the trade market and you might be able to buy it for cheap. One stat I would prioritize where you can get it is cooldown recovery. This will give you a higher uptime on both machine army and overload, which is especially important later into the endgame. With that in mind, Warhorn is absolutely going to be your best in slot. It's what makes your spider tanks shine, and at that point you drop the lightning spirit and potentially the whole alchemist tree. It opens up a lot of options for both fizz and ailments. It also makes it a lot easier to unify your damage, so you'll more easily be able to work in something like a curse. Something else that struck me as interesting, and a thing I may play around with in the future, is Decayed Mind. With two of them, your minions are able to deal pure erosion damage. And this fixes the scaling issue that I've mentioned before of multiple different minions not having a unified damage type. You will be giving up a significant amount of stats by using two legendary rings, but because the requirements for the build are fairly generic, and they do both have fizz as extra erosion damage, it should actually be a fairly small cost to pay in comparison to a lot of other builds. On the opposite extreme, if you don't want an army of small minions, but you want one big gigaboss minion, along with focusing in more on your lightning spirits, you could go with a Machine Lord Helmet. It will limit you to a single lonely spider tank, but this spider tank will absolutely wreck everything, as it's going to be supercharged to deal absolutely massive damage. At this point, it would be less of a synthetic army and more of a summon spirit super soldier. And just from a little experimentation, the amount of damage this setup can output is absolutely terrifying. At low levels, I enjoyed building around the class fantasy of having a minion army follow me around. But as I continued, I found it was more effective to focus on one type of minion, or multiple minions that deal damage in similar ways, such as projectile minions. This is why I combined the lightning spirits with the spider tank. Machine guards can work as well, but that would be their own build. If you want to focus on spirits, spider tanks can be a support. Again, there's quite a bit of flexibility here. One other thing to be aware of is, spamming dark gate can lead to a DPS loss. Yes, it's great for properly repositioning your minions. Outside of that though, it does confuse them for a fraction of a second. So it can be better to use machine army on cooldown and only proc dark gate when you need the overload, or of course for reposition. Super early on, the gearing didn't feel that impactful because there weren't that many minion rolls. But on the other hand, you get a lot of early power through skill levels through your talents. So you won't really feel the lack of power, and if anything, that means it's all the easier to gear your character. In general, I'm not the biggest fan of minions in games. However, I do like Torchlight Infinite's more active approach. It almost feels like I'm a support or a raid leader, where the correct buff timing and making sure my minions get out of a fire while keeping overload up so they don't die means bosses are still engaging. I also found minions to be super approachable because if you mess up your rotation, you can always resummon any minion who dies. So those are the three best builds that I've found to start your journey into the world of Leptis. If you decide to play any of the builds on the list, please let me know down in the comments. On the other hand, if you're playing something else, share that as well, as maybe it'll inspire someone to do something different. One of Torchlight Infinite's greatest strengths is until level 80, you can respec your character completely for free. And after level 80, it just costs a little bit of currency that you'll find through the course of normal gameplay. So if you're not enjoying your current build, or you just want to try something different, you can always give one of these a try, and if you change your mind later, just swap back to what you were playing before. Another big thanks to XD for sponsoring this video. If you've made it this far in the video, and you haven't tried Torchlight Infinite yet, you really have no excuse. You could be zooming through maps as a whirlwind Rahan, ignoring enemies as you casually spin to win, or you could be dropping fire with the hottest build in the game, Flamejet Gemma. It's so hot that you literally turn the floor into lava. But true heroes never fight alone. So using the power of friendship and a lot of mechanical soldiers, you could also overcome your enemies as Commander Moto. All of these setups start working very early on in the game, and it will take you all the way through Time Mark 7 without a high investment into gear like boss drop legendaries, nor will they require any of the rare embers nor any legendary packed spirits. Instead, you can just grab some cheap legendaries off the market or use whatever items you find to get started. All of these builds clear pretty well, and also have options to do single target damage that scale with continued investment. As you continue your min-max journey by adding some of the legendaries I outlined or crafting better items, they'll all be able to farm tier 8, and in fact, if my experiences on the Rahan build are any implication of how the others will function when fully min-maxed, not only will you be able to do tier 8, you'll be able to breeze through time mark 8. So far, it's been a blast playing all of these builds, and with the game's release into open beta, I'm looking forward to playing some spicy new builds, possibly something involving damage over time, since that's not an archetype I've experimented with much thus far. So for now, 
I only have one more question. What are you playing, Hunter? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below.